So if you uh, remember that we have been talking about um, the S matrix and uh, we have written in terms of the reflection and the transmission coefficients uh, and uh, this was actually written as R T prime and T R prime where R prime and uh, R and T prime and T are the reflection and the transmission coefficients uh, corresponding to the left edge and the right edge of the uh, system which are connected to the system is connected to leads. So, uh, the one corresponds to the left lead and the other corresponds to the right lead. Uh, and um, I uh, sort of wanted to uh, give you a little more uh, information on this S matrix and uh, let us just uh, try to understand this uh, from a purely quantum mechanical point of view. Uh, so, let us uh, think of a potential okay? and the potential is given by V of x and uh, you have uh, an amplitude going inward which is A and there is an amplitude going outward which is uh, B and similarly on the other side there are outgoing uh, amplitude going as C. These are the amplitudes of the waves and uh, this is again uh, uh, which is inward that is moving towards the uh, left which is uh, given by D. Okay? So, uh, for a closed system which means that uh, it is not uh, connected to the surrounding and in uh, more technical terms it means that it is not a dissipative system, it is not connected to a bath. So, we can assume that uh, V of x is real, okay? it is a real function and in which case S is a unitary matrix. Okay? And uh, the unitarity condition is represented by this uh, where S dagger S is equal to a unit matrix and the unit matrix suppose I write a unit matrix in a 2 by 2 unit matrix then it should be 1 0 and 0 1 okay in 3 by 3 it will just go up uh, in dimensions. So, uh, you consider a scattering region uh, and the wave functions uh, are um, represented by their amplitudes uh, A, B, C and D which are uh, respectively moving towards their directions in which they are shown and uh, I can write down a transmitted uh, wave, let us call it as a transmitted which is equal to the S uh, which is the S matrix of the incident wave and this has been told that this is how the transmitted wave function is connected to the incident wave function and uh, we can write this as P uh, C uh, which are respectively you know these are uh, reflected and the transmitted waves uh, and these are S11, S12, S21, S22 and, uh, <coughs> and these are uh, A and D. So, uh, the B and C, let me write it uh, the way I wrote uh, here inside a square bracket. So, this is uh, the uh, way this, uh, so B and C, just to reiterate, these are outgoing amplitudes and um, A and D are incoming amplitudes. So, uh, this um, unitarity condition which is S dagger S is equal to 1 uh, that implies that we can write this as uh, S dagger S. So, S dagger S is equal to 1. Uh, so, what does it mean? Okay. So, I, I can just simply write it as uh, this S dagger S as S11 mod square plus S12 mod square S11 S21 star uh, plus S12, S22 star and um, S21, S11 star plus S22, S12 star and S22 mod square plus S21 mod square. Okay? And this if it is unitary matrix, so this is S dagger uh, S 
and if this is a unitary matrix then this is equal to 1 0 and 0 1 okay uh, which immediately tells you that uh, s11 mod square plus s12 mod square is equal to 1 and s22 mod square plus s21 mod square is equal to 1 and all these um, other things so this is uh, you can call it as uh, equation number 1 and and this as equation number 2 it's also true that uh, the off diagonal elements are zero which means that s11 s21 star plus s12 s22 star this is equal to zero and also the complex conjugate which are s21 s11 star plus s22 s12 star that's equal to zero as well and you can call this as equation number three and this as equation number four so these are the properties of the s matrix and these are the elements uh, that follow these uh, equations and so on if you subtract you know one from two uh, then what you get is the following that you have a s11 mod square minus a s22 mod square this is equal to s21 mod square minus s12 mod square this is equal to zero and as well uh, which tells you that s11 uh, mod equal to s22 mod and uh, s21 mod equal to s12 mod and uh, the reason that we write it with a modulus is because these are in general complex numbers okay uh, so these are the terms or rather the elements of this matrix and their uh, interdependencies that we uh, you know wish to talk about okay so um, let's look at uh, the eigenvalues of s which are of the form so this eigen eigenvalues of s are of the form uh, e to the power i phi 1 and e to the power i phi 2 because uh, these are in general uh, complex numbers. So these uh, phi 1 and phi 2 are real. Okay, so uh, they are basically known as uh, phi 1 and phi 2 are known as scattering uh, phase shifts. Okay, so each problem in quantum mechanics, whether there's an incoming particle that's uh, colliding with a wall or scattering against a wall, wall means a, a potential barrier. Uh, these are all called as scattering problems okay and these um, are the barrier transmission problems in its uh, simple form uh, so uh, these are uh, the properties of the s matrix the s matrix the, the eigenvalues are complex in general uh, while these phi 1 and phi 2 which are real quantities are known as the phase shifts okay so uh, let us uh, assume that uh, for a given case uh, for uh, v of x equal to v of minus x this means that the potential is even under parity so what does it mean it means that if you change x to minus x uh, v of x doesn't change and you have this seen this kind of potential uh, for a uh, harmonic oscillator which is like uh, half m omega square x square right so here uh, v of x equal to half m omega square x square or half kx square now if you change the sign of x because x square doesn't change sign uh, v of x will be equal to v of minus x okay now in this particular case the s matrix takes a form which are r or t T and R, we are talking about a single barrier. Barrier has, of course, uh, I mean two ends. So R and T are um, the complex reflection and the transmission coefficients.
okay and uh, we know that uh, the reflection uh, amplitude which goes as uh, mod small r square is equal to r and uh, the capital T is equal to small t square. Now this S11 mod square plus S12 mod square is equal to 1 is equivalent to R square plus T square which uh, it's equal to 1 or R plus T equal to 1 which it has to be uh, because the reflection plus the transmission amplitudes uh, probabilities should add up to 1 and this is uh, precisely the coming from the properties of the S matrix which is this. Uh, this is the equation that I am referring to. Okay? Uh, this equation is uh, it, it denotes R plus T equal to 1 capital R plus capital equal to 1. All right. So, um, let us uh, you know, uh, if given these conditions, let us uh, assume that R equal to without any loss of generality. So, let us assume that this is equal to phi R uh, because capital R equal to small r mod square I am taking and small r is a complex quantity. So, this is uh, capital R is of course a real quantity. This uh, it is root over R and exponential I phi R where phi R is a phase corresponding to the reflected wave. And similarly, one can write down uh, uh, this uh, relation which is this is equal to uh, T which is 1 minus R uh, and exponential I phi R. Okay? So, this is the T. So, unitarity act further tells you uh, that the phase shift under this uh, transmission, I mean the transmission and the reflection coefficients uh, will have a phase shift which is pi by 2 which is coming from this e to the i uh, plus or minus i and uh, uh, if you uh, remember your i is nothing but exponential i pi by 2 uh, because this is equal to cos pi by 2 which is 0 plus i sin pi by 2 which is equal to 1. Okay? So, which means that this is equal to i. Okay, this, this is a, a sort of understanding. So, that is why the R and T can be written as that and um, now of course, uh, uh, your S11, uh, S21 star plus S12, S22 star uh, this is equal to 0 which is coming from the, uh, this equation uh, that we are talking about uh, from which is coming from the off diagonal term of the S matrix. And uh, from this what one can get is the following that one can get a R T star uh, plus a T R star should be equal to 0. And uh, in, in addition to these relationships which uh, we have let me use another color these uh, definitions of R and T uh, we also have uh, this expression which is another relationship between R and T. Okay? All right. So, um, now that tells uh, that uh, if I uh, write these things properly using these relations above, uh, then I get uh, 2 of mod r uh, mod t which is equal to cosine of uh, phi r minus phi t uh, that is equal to 0 that tells you. So, this is uh, equivalent to r t star plus t r star and uh, this is equivalent to uh, a phi r minus a phi t. So, this is equal to uh, plus minus pi by 2 is what I have uh, told you earlier that the reflected wave and the transmitted wave will be phase uh, different, uh, will have a phase difference of uh, either plus pi by 2 or minus pi by 2. Either it will la lead or lag and the transmitted wave will either uh, lead or lag. Okay? Now, let us take a specific example. Okay? Uh, Let us uh, take a, a form for uh, which is not too different than what we have talked about is equal to R um, identity matrix plus a T sigma x where sigma x is a x component of the Pauli matrix which is written as 0 1 1 0. Okay? So, uh, this is uh, almost same as what you have uh, seen earlier. So, this is uh, coming in as an example. Okay? So, I am trying to uh, work out 
uh, the entire barrier transmission problem in terms of the S matrix and the properties of the S matrix. This is quite um, sort of pedagogical in dealing with a variety of uh, generic uh, potentials okay, which uh, in terms of their reflection and transmission amplitudes. Uh, now, you know that uh, each of the these Pauli matrices have eigenvalues equal to plus 1, uh, plus 1 or minus 1. So, sigma x has eigenvalues uh, plus minus 1, uh, this is true with sigma y as well as sigma z, okay. all have eigenvalues plus minus 1, they have other properties such as uh, you know each one of them uh, square is equal to 1 for all i equal to x, y, z, it is not relevant here, but still uh, I let me tell you this, the determinant of each one of the sigma i is equal to uh, minus 1 and the trace of each of the sigmas sigma i equal to 0 for all i and so on and each one of them have eigenvalues plus minus 1. So, the eigenvalues of s is um, s is equal to either r plus t or r minus t. Okay, because of uh, the identity of course, identity matrix has eigenvalues uh, only one. Uh, so, it is uh, r and then either plus t or minus t. So, if you uh, define r plus t equal to uh, exponential i phi 1, where phi 1 is a phase of that and r minus t equal to exponential i phi 2, then from this r becomes equal to exponential minus i phi 2 and uh, divided by 2 and t becomes equal to uh, exponential i phi 1 plus i phi 2 divided by 2. So, um, in addition to this, let us define a phi average which is equal to phi 1 plus phi 2 by 2 and delta phi to be phi 1 minus phi 2. In this case, your r becomes equal to which is a reflection amplitude which is equal to r mod square, it is equal to sin square uh, delta phi and t becomes equal to uh, t square which is equal to cos square delta phi. Okay. And um, to uh, see basically how this makes sense, if you take phi 1 equal to phi 2, uh, it means of course that sin square delta phi uh, will have no reflection. So, r is equal to uh, 0 and uh, the, the S matrix will take a form which is exponential i phi 1 and a 1 0 0 1 and so on so forth. Okay. So, th this tells you that if uh, the there is no difference between uh, the reflected and the transmitted waves then of course, which means that there is no reflection that occurs and, and the, the whole thing is transmitted. And we have uh, um, used this, so this actually corresponds to a particular kind of potential where uh, we have started with the S matrix instead of the potential and have calculated the uh, reflection and the transmission coefficients. This is precisely what we have done while calculating the conductance of a, of a junction uh, rather two junctions and how this two junctions give rise to uh, the conductance which is given by the trace of uh, T dagger T where T uh, denotes the transmission amplitudes. Okay. Now, um, this uh, sort of gives you a sort of overall introduction about uh, the conductance properties of uh, a mesoscale systems or in systems where uh, you have uh, there are ballistic transport and uh, there are not much of inelastic collisions. Uh, so, the system is small and uh, from here on uh, let us go and uh, talk about the Hall effect. Uh, we will we'll like to start with the Hall effect uh, and gradually want to go into quantum Hall effect, uh, which is the main topic of our discussion. So, how is this uh, previous discussion related to this discussion? 
we are going to talk about conductivity either in Hall effect or uh, you know in the longitudinal uh, conductivity that one gets that is uh, as you pass current through a material in the direction of passing current uh, there are there is a resistivity or a conductivity that develops and if you want to measure it uh, the this is the way to measure it which is what we have uh, learned in the last uh, discussion that we had ok. Now, um, let us uh, sort of talk about the discovery of uh, Hall effect to begin with ok and uh, let us start with actually quantum Hall effect. So, uh, we will we'll come to classical Hall effect that you all are familiar with in just uh, some time. So, this is known very precisely you know uh, I mean the discovery of this thing occurred uh, in the night of uh, 4th and 5th February 1980 okay and uh, if you want to be precise about this uh, this happened at about 2 am in the morning the name of the discoverer is uh, k v kletzing klaus von kletzing and he discovered it and uh, in his notes on that night uh, he actually said something very very interesting he said that um, he actually gave the resistance uh, the which is a you know the benchmark of resistance uh, and uh, from this experiment which is done on particular type of uh, system semiconductors uh, two dimensional semiconductor uh, semiconducting systems where uh, the electron gases are mobile only in uh, on a plane and from there he actually uh, did the Hall effect experiment. Uh, this happened in uh, Grenoble uh, France and it happened uh, in, in a lab which has facilities of large magnetic fields and by large magnetic fields uh, what we mean is about maybe 10 tesla uh, or even more uh, 5 to uh, 15 tesla say for example ok. And uh, how did he discover quantum Hall effect? Uh, the background story is that he has been working closely with uh, two gentlemen called uh, Dorda, Dorda and Pepper ok who were uh, engineers and uh, who supplied samples to Klaus von Kletzing and uh, the samples uh, to study the mobility of silicon MOSFETs ok. Uh, so, th there is a semiconductor industry which was growing at that time and um, it is uh, it was quite important to actually get very high uh, mobility samples. So, they were trying to increase the mobility of the samples of the silicon MOSFETs and that is how it uh, got uh, sort of you know discovered. These are fed devices uh, the field effect transistor devices which were um, uh, quite important to study in those days and still now. So, they supplied the samples and uh, Klitzing did the experiment and uh, Klitzing of course, uh, won a Nobel prize uh, for this discovery and uh, incidentally I will tell you about the uh, details of the discovery and that we will discuss throughout this course this incidentally this discovery occurred about just about 100 years later than Edwin Hall uh, who discovered Hall effect. The Hall effect that you all are familiar with the classical Hall effect in 1879. So, 1879 and 1980 uh, with just about 101 years apart and uh, that is where the interesting thing came. So, what is the di uh, difference between classical Hall effect and quantum Hall effect uh, that we are going to study? 
the classical Hall effect is at uh, room temperature and uh, it is at very low magnetic field is less than 1 tesla or even less than 0.5 tesla that we do in our lab. I will discuss that experiment uh, that you one does in the undergraduate labs of uh, uh, of any of this institution or any of the you know uh, teaching uh, colleges or uh, other institutes that one has. And um, it was found that uh, uh, this experiment by Edwin Hall uh, very accurately measures uh, the type of semiconductors from the sign of what, what we call as a Hall uh, coefficients and it also uh, gives a, a nice order of estimate for the density of the carriers. So, the Hall resistivity, I will just give you an example what Hall resistivity is or the Hall resistivity which is um, you know uh, defined by something like, um, so the Hall resistivity let us call it as R just R which is equal to Hall voltage uh, divided by the longitudinal current. And in fact, a more uh, familiar quantity is known as R h. This is uh, found to be uh, like B over n q, where B is the magnetic field and n is the density of the carriers and q is the charge of the carriers, which uh, of course, we know that they are electrons. And uh, there is a quantity which is more um, familiarly used which is called as a Hall coefficients which is R over B which is equal to 1 over n q because we do not know whether uh, the carriers are holes or electrons that is why we want to leave it as q. So, this is uh, one of the main findings is that the Hall resistivity is proportional to B which means that the Hall resistivity will grow linearly with B like this. Okay. And, uh, this slope is nothing but it is equal to 1 over n q. Now, this slope whether it is a positive slope or you have a plot which goes like this that will tell you that uh, the slope is uh, has a positive sign or a negative sign and this sign will decide that what kind of carriers you have and the overall magnitude of the slope will tell you that uh, the what is n that is the density of the carriers in that particular uh, material or the semiconductor. Okay. So, this was uh, the Hall experiment or Hall effect is all about. So, let me try to make you give a feel that what actually is done in the lab. So, this is a classical Hall effect setup. Okay. And uh, let me make the drawing a little big and clear such that uh, you are okay. So, this is say a uh, Hall sample. Uh, this is the uh, let's let's call this as width as W. Now this is uh, drawn not in scale. These samples are usually very thin samples, almost flat, uh, close to two dimension. But I'm showing it with a width which is W. And uh, let's say the uh, this uh, breadth uh, of the sample is equal to D. And um, uh, you send a current which is J X here and let me uh, show the axis to be this is x, this is y and this is z axis. Okay. So, so there is a magnetic field that is uh, applied in this direction because this is the z axis and there is a current that uh, is uh, sent in this direction that is the x direction, see the x direction in the figure and now you want to measure the voltage in the y direction and that is called as a Hall voltage. Okay. So, this is where you measure the voltage 
by maybe a voltmeter or a multimeter and so on okay so this is the setup that you have typical setup that you have in the labs that you so these uh, the top and the bottom uh, sort of uh, planes are connected to a voltage measuring device and this is um, so you have charges here so voltage measuring device which is uh, denoted by vh which measures the hall voltage okay so what happens is that uh, so there are these uh, uh, these charges which uh, experience low range force and the low range force these charges are moving because you're talking about uh, almost like a free electron system so uh, the force is given by uh, q v cross b uh, now your v is they're moving along the x direction and then b is in the z direction so they are of course going to uh, get deflected in the y direction which is a vertical direction here okay and um, i'll uh, sort of do a simple analysis now and then probably do a more refined analysis later this is i'm just talking about a lab how a lab undergraduate lab would uh, look at this thing all right so uh, at equilibrium so what will happen is that all the charges will start migrating either in the plus uh, y direction or minus y direction depending on their sign and then you have uh, these uh, once the equilibrium is established the motion of the charges will stop after that okay so what it means is that uh, you have so this is a uh, there is a qv cross b that's a low range force but there is also an electrical uh, so this is due to the uh, magnetic field there is due to an electric field there is also a force which is proportional to or in the direction of the electric field so the total force on this is equal to fb plus fe uh, the electric field is because you are passing a current so you are there is a battery that's connected which i have not shown uh, but that is there and that's why you have an electric force there so this is equal to q into e plus v cross b and this at equilibrium is equal to zero okay so understand that uh, the charges cannot move due to these two uh, fields indefinitely okay they would the eventually they would all uh, all the charges that are present in the system will either settle at the top plane or the bottom plane uh, once you know the the apparatus is switched on for quite some time when the equilibrium will be established okay v denotes of course the uh, the drift velocity of the carriers and so on and then because of this uh, there is a ey that's going to be created because if you are measuring a hall voltage there must be a, a electric field due to the hall voltage which must be created which is equal to a vbz which is equal to uh, jx which is equal to v uh, let me write it with a capital j so this is equal to jx by uh, nq and uh, b is only in the z direction so i don't have to write a bz uh, so this is jx by nq and then uh, bz so what you do is that here n is the charge density all right so uh, the ratio this ey divided by a j x b this called as a hall coefficient and let's write it as uh, with r h h capital h standing for hall okay and uh, what we have shown is that this r h is equal to uh, so this is e y divided by j x into b this is equal to a v h uh, d divided by i into b where we have written the j x to be the linear density of current which is equal to i over d because j x was in the denominator so this is equal to i over d d is the sort of width of this current uh, i mean this sample that you see here okay so uh, from this equation so this is equal to 1 over nq which is what i have said from this is it's very clear that uh, this uh, depends on the type of carrier density 
and also the density the actual n which is the density of the carriers okay so this is the experimental setup and so on so you uh, how you actually uh, apply the magnetic field that's the question okay and what you do is that you put the sample in presence or or in between uh, the pole pieces of an electromagnet such that that direction because if you put something in between an electromagnet the magnetic field is going to penetrate that sample and that becomes your z direction which is shown here in this particular direction towards semi okay and uh, then you sort of pass a current in a in a one of the other two directions call that as a x direction and measure the voltage in the third direction let's call that as a y direction so once you do that and uh, these uh, electromagnets uh, as we have in the labs in almost all labs that are uh, having these uh, experiments at the undergraduate or even at the msc level uh, the a magnetic field is not large it's about 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 tesla uh, anything between 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 tesla and so on so this uh, magnetic field is applied so that the electrons um, they drift uh, along the y direction and you measure the voltage okay so uh, from the direction of the current and the magnetic field uh, one can estimate the direction and accumulation of the uh, charge carriers uh, in this y direction okay and uh, connect one of the voltage probes uh, that is hall voltage probes which is shown here okay so that's a hall voltage probe and then such that you actually by, by connecting say a voltmeter and um, uh, so connect the other voltage probe to the other side of the voltmeter or maybe the ammeter and um, leave this connection the way that it is now you uh, record in this experiment you record the voltages record four sets of readings okay and uh, these readings are uh, you measure the voltage by this voltage probe or uh, these uh, hall voltage probe which is either a millivolt meter or a or an ammeter and so on so you you measure it for a given magnetic field and uh, current okay uh, let's call this as v1 uh, okay so let's call this uh, bi that is uh, b applied in a particular direction which is say the plus z direction and uh, i which is which is along the plus x direction let's call that as v1 now you uh, change the direction of current okay by changing the pole pieces of the battery that is driving the current let's call that as v2 you now you calculate uh, a minus b and i that is you change the in the electromagnet you uh, reverse the pole pieces and calculate which is known as v3 and then finally you have a minus b minus i which let's call it as v4 okay so this v3 is uh, for the reverse field and uh, v4 is the reverse field and the current and uh, this is the uh, reverse current and so on okay so now using these uh, data that you have in the lab uh, your vh in terms of this v1 v2 etc can be written as v1 minus v2 minus v3 minus uh, plus v4 and so on okay and divided by v1 minus v2 minus v3 uh, and plus v4 and um, so this is uh, the expression for the hall voltage and you note down the hall voltage and um, once you get the hall voltage you can put it into the formula that had been discussed that once you get this hall voltage you know the current or and you know the dimensions of the system which is d and i uh, and you also know the magnetic field so you can get rh which is nothing but uh, 1 over nq okay and uh, you repeat the measurements with uh, whatever values of magnetic field and current that are available to you and uh, usually the width of the sample that is d is uh, of the order of is about up to maybe around 5 mm um, and w is around w is very small this is around 0.5 mm 
okay so this is the uh, like the or the length of the sample and the width of the sample which is the the thickness of the sample so to say is a 0.5 mm which is um, you know uh, these are samples that are available and uh, now you can uh, draw suitable graphs and uh, as a function of b uh, and vh and then you can actually calculate uh, from the slope you know what are the the sign of the charge carriers that is whether they are electrons or uh, whether they are holes and uh, the fact remains at the end that your r h uh, or r is proportional to b so the r versus b is a straight line is what i mean okay now when von klitzing did this experiment he found something very uh, unusual and this unusual things gave rise to a lot of interesting phenomena he found that the hall uh, resistivity we will write it as r or we will write it as rho it has a structure like this uh, there is a very rough drawing but and and so on and then uh, you know this there is a bit of uh, so this is as a function of b and the experiment is done at i will show you better pictures of this but right now it is just a schematic drawing and uh, why did i uh, not show this uh, kind of step like structure because this is the region where the classical fall effect is uh, the experiment is done at very small b where it is almost like a straight line okay which i uh, did not show of course uh, showed it with a freehand drawing which is uh, and uh, just to show that there is no plateau structure there so this plateaus actually through a lot of surprise and uh, why should there be plateaus and what happens which means that uh, the hall resistivity does not increase uh, in this region as you increase the magnetic field you have to understand that why should hall uh, the resistance uh, would increase with the magnetic field okay a very simple sort of calculation would uh, show you this that uh, you know when you uh, change the magnetic field you actually change the carrier density and how you change the carrier density you change it because your this is like 0 to mu so this is your carrier density is equal to some uh, f of e uh, g of e and d of e okay so this e is the energy of the electrons in presence of a magnetic field okay we do not know as yet what that is but this is a general formula this is for the density uh, of electrons or is the total number of electrons okay i mean you can uh, you can write this as total number of electrons because you have integrated the density of states so either i write n and then somehow if i divide it by v that is will become the density of uh, carriers so in that case it becomes n now uh, this is some function of e which sort of you know this uh, includes a magnetic field so this is the fermi distribution function to remind you what is the fermi distribution function the distribution function is exponential beta epsilon minus mu uh, plus 1 and uh, so this uh, is the bare electron where electronic energy levels are written as h cross square k square over 2 m uh, and uh, mu denotes the chemical potential here this may, mu is the chemical potential and this is the density of states okay so uh, because uh, every quantity physical quantity that you would uh, like to determine depends on the density of states that how many states are there that tells you what the properties will be and how the properties are different in different dimensions okay and because this density of states have different behavior with energy and we are really looking for energies close to the fermi energy for most of our conductance uh, behavior okay so this tells you that as you sweep b or as you increase b uh, we told that uh, you put things inside an electromagnet and take reading for various b's uh, which means that uh, you make the current that is flowing in the electromagnet to be larger and larger so that you can actually sweep over a range of magnetic field there it was uh, very small you start from zero magnetic field and go up to maybe 0.4 uh, tesla whereas here you go up to maybe 10 tesla or 15 tesla which is a large magnetic field 
and um, these uh, distribution function will be uh, proportional to not really proportional, but it will sort of scale as you change the magnetic field because of the reason that uh, this quantity the Fermi distribution function will be a function of B because the it will enter through the energy. I wrote it separately, but does not mean that we are talking about uh, the, these two will scale independently, they will depend on each other and this will increase as you sweep B as you make B to be larger. Uh, when that happens, uh, then the conductivity will be different, okay. it will change just like in the classical Hall effect we saw that uh, as you change B uh, this uh, resistivity or the Hall I mean the Hall resistance so to say uh, that scales with uh, the magnetic field. Here also you should do that, but uh, why is this region this plateau region coming? And because of this plateau region, it is these are called plateaus. And because of this plateau region, uh, the name had come that it is a quantized Hall effect or a quantum Hall effect. Because here uh, the resistivity is not just a monotonic function, linear function of B, but it uh, shows plateaus and these plateaus are interesting. Now, what Klitzing found out on the day of his discovery in which he actually wrote uh, some nice notes, they are uh, sort of illegible uh, because they have been you know used uh, many times, but he had found out that these uh, resistivities are quantized in h over e square, which means this has a value h over e square. I am just giving you an example, this is h over 2 e square is h over 3 e square and so on. Okay? So, these are happening these uh, now these are resistivity. So, they have so this is this value is h over 3 e square this value is h over 2 is e square and this value is h over e square and so on and so forth. Okay? And he found that this has a value which is it is 25.813 uh, kilo ohms okay? and uh, this is uh, a resistance which is now taken as a unit of resistance. Now, you see that H is a Planck's constant, okay. E is the electronic charge and these two put together define a unit of resistance. These are quantum mechanical quantities like H sets the scale of energy. I mean, if you remember that uh, E equal to H nu or H cross omega. Uh, as appeared in Planck's theory of radiation. Uh, so, this is the quantized energy of the photons uh, with H having a value which is 6.63 into 10 to the power minus 34 joule second. And um, uh, this H was initially introduced by uh, Bohr's theory of uh, atoms where the electrons uh, have angular momenta which are quantized in unit of uh, H uh, such that uh, when they move around in the stationary orbits, they do not uh, emit uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation and uh, these are called as the stationary orbits. Okay? And uh, uh, E is the electronic charge which has a value 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. Thus, all these uh, microscopic quantities uh, H and E uh, they put together define uh, the unit of resistance which is uh, h over e square uh, which is a measurable quantity and uh, it comes out in the Hall experiment. Okay? And um, now this is known as uh, metrology, what it means is that uh, uh, metrology is uh, uh, the scientific study of measurement uh, which uh, establishes a common understanding of units in the context of this uh, modern uh, manufacturing industry. Uh, metrology also refers to the calibration of machines that are used in the production process. And uh, for example, uh, the defining the length of an object, uh, one uses the laser interferometry. So, here uh, we define the unit of resistance or we fix resistance. Uh, by this experiment and this experiment think of this it is done in the lab. Okay? Of course, we are talking about uh, low temperature and large magnetic field, but they are still accessible. Low temperature is uh, we know that uh, liquid nitrogen temperature or liquid helium temperature if you want to go to still lower 
values like liquid helium temperature is about uh, 4.2 Kelvin and liquid nitrogen is about 77 Kelvin. These are low, low enough temperatures for a specific kind of experiments. I mean you probably need to go to uh, farther lower temperatures to see uh, some other effects. Uh, let us not go into that, but here uh, it is an experiment that is done with, uh, with samples which are uh, not perfectly clean which we will see in, in the coming uh, discussions, uh, but they still are able to fix the value of the resistance. This is the uh, one of the main triumphs of the quantum Hall effect which uh, was missing in the classical version of the Hall effect which could only give you for a given sample which could give you the sign of the carriers that is I, whether they are electrons or holes or what is the carrier density th for that particular sample which could be anything between 10 to the power 16 to 10 to the power 19, but it does not say anything uh, which is a fundamental quantity. Now, this tells you about a fundamental quantity. Uh, if you see that it has the uh, really the uh, resistance, the unit of resistance H over E square uh, and uh, we will also you know um, in uh, almost a similar manner we will talk about uh, conductivity which has a scale which is inverse of that. So, this is called as conductivity and conductivity is um, either written in ohm inverse or it is written as mo MHO. Uh, so, this omega is called ohm and this is called as uh, mo just the opposite uh, ok. So, that is called as a conductance. So, I hope just to put things in perspective in uh, half a minute, uh, we have uh, done uh, a thorough calculation of uh, conductivity in uh, nanostructures or mesostructures, mesoscopic quantities rather uh, systems, the mesoscopic scales of those quantities. And um, then uh, we uh, came to talk about Hall effect which is uh, not uh, we are not interested in calculating the longitudinal resistance which of course, we also would be you know discussing longitudinal resistance, uh, but here we are more interested in talking about the transverse resistance that is uh, uh, perpendicular to the direction uh, where you send the current you, uh, you measure the voltage in a direction which is perpendicular to that that is called as a Hall voltage. So, uh, the, uh, the the system or rather the, the formalism does not change, uh, the system also remains the same excepting that uh, we are talking about a different resistance and a different resistivity of the material, property of the material and the property very convincingly shows us the resistivity to be uh, a universal constant and uh, 25.813 kilo ohm corresponds to the value h over e square which are known to be purely quantum mechanical quantities. Yeah.